The world is at a crossroads as far as the safety and well-being of our ecosystem is concerned. With rampant urbanization, environmental degradation and grave consequences of climate change, an overall path correction has become imperative to the existence of all living forms on Earth. Should we continue with the abuse of our precious natural resources? Should we use technology and innovation to conserve them? Can we reduce energy usage with a mindful approach and renewable sources? Dr. Prem Jain anticipated many such challenges we are facing today way back in the 70s. Over half a century of dedication and tireless efforts, he thought and spoke a language that was way ahead of its time. <coughs> his passion and commitment to his Janmabhumi and to his own mother ran equally deep. From my earliest childhood, it been ingrained with me that truth will always win. What we call Satyamev Jayate. She also gave us the love for all living human, living creatures, trees and plants the message of non-violence and ever since my childhood I have always respected that that all life forms are equally important. The last 10 years saw the culmination of his efforts by remarkably shaping the green movement in India and his countless admirers began to refer to him as father of green buildings in India. The green revolution he started is the foundation of his legacy. In 2018 Brain Jain Memorial Trust was conceived to carry on his mission and founded upon his values, ideals and vision of a greener Bharat. Today, the Trust enjoys guidance of the best minds of the industry, champions of sustainability, corporate change makers and academicians. PJMT is set on its journey to create, establish and maintain sustainability directions through education, recognition and rewards that nurture future generations. The best gift you can give to the person is educate him or her. Because then, wherever they are, they will be able to earn and flourish in life. Each year begins with the Harith Prem Bharat Mahotsav, a week-long celebration of sustainability and our annual flagship event, Prem Jain Memorial Address. The Trust organizes a spectrum of green initiatives which fill the week of January 26, Dr. Jain's birthday week. The Mahotsav is celebrated across the country with immense enthusiasm by green crusaders and our partner institutions through an array of sustainability-driven initiatives and activities. Having deep roots with Indian Green Building Council the Trust has worked in tandem with IGBC and its chapters. PJMT takes great pride in partnering with esteemed partner societies, corporate leaders and premier universities across India, working closely with the common mission of creating a greener earth through the year. The Trust is a catalyst for sustainable research and development, sharing innovations and creating a global platform for exchange of thoughts and ideas to nurture future green ambassadors. PJMT has organized more than 300 green initiatives during Harith Prem Bharat Mahotsav in association with its esteemed partner societies, corporates and institutions across India and arranged over 300 online sessions by distinguished speakers and industry change makers on sustainable built environment with participation of more than 5,000 students and working professionals. At this edition of Harith Prem Bharat Mahotsav, we invite you to join this green revolution, to build a brighter tomorrow and change the world we will leave behind for our children. If we can change the way we think about buildings, maybe what we build will change the world. Great, thank you.
you, Yatin, and good evening to all of you, participants, particularly from some of the partner college institutions that we have here at the Indian Memorial Trust. Uh, I'm going to keep this brief this time. I, you know, did, we have a very, very distinguished and wonderful speaker, but first, he is a very good friend and a valued uh, well wisher, uh, Christian. Christian and I go back probably about 25, 30 years now. He has been in the space of energy, predominantly renewable energy, from way before people talked about such things and in terms of sustainability. I think in, it was in the early 90s that we first explored the prospect of doing such renewable energy directions. He has, he has strode the, uh, the industry scene uh, over particularly the last 10 years with some, uh, I would say, some very, very vantage viewpoints that he has had on climate action and its impact upon us. That is all I want to say about Christian. Uh, well, as far as the others go, you will, uh, and uh, I'll, Christian, if you don't mind, I will stop here. I will request you to take over and present what, you know, in some ways you and I have discussed on what this, what this entire scenario of the next say, 30 years means. I know of, of, of all those uh, very considered reflections that you have shared with me personally sometimes. Uh, you think you'll have to help him out on the slide and the deck. Uh, over to uh, Christian. It's already there, sir. Yes, Rishi, you should take over this slide. Uh, we can all see the deck here. Thank you, Ari, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, can you go to the first slide? So uh, for me, it's indeed a personal pleasure and a privilege to talk on Dr. Prem Jain's Memorial Trust event because uh, I have, of course, been closely associated with, uh, you know, CI, GBCI, but more from the green power side, but have been witness to the wonderful work that Dr. Jain has done. And uh, my topic would be climate action and green economy, because I'm quite sure that uh, as Dr. Jain would have visualized, if we have to really make this transition, whether it is from uh, you know, fossil energy to clean energy or from classical habitats to green buildings, it has to be done under an economic framework with uh, all stakeholders benefiting from it. And that will only happen if it's in a transition through a green economy framework and not just as a mandate. Uh, I bear in mind the trust mission to create, establish and maintain sustainability paradigm to education, recognition, nurturing of the present and future generations. Hence, in talking of green economy, I'd like to portray some opportunities. And I'd like to emphasize that my idea is to only give an overview and to you know, provoke thinking and hope to have an interactive discussion and also be open to even responding through emails if anyone uh, you know, wants to reach out to me. I will cover green economy for both urban and rural areas because uh, in a country of 1.4 billion, uh, rural India still has a very major share and thanks to Industry 4.0, we'll continue to have a major share of our population for quite the foreseeable future. And therefore, what I intend doing is, again, to give contextual, frame, contextual framework, draw upon content from two recent speeches I gave. One was in the BRICS High Level Forum, which was Sustainable Solutions for Green and Low Carbon Development of Cities. And uh, later on in a India-US Economic Partnership, showcasing a profitable ESG opportunities, where I show the topic of sustainable energy integrated with smart and sustainable agriculture. Next, please. Uh, you can do it in PowerPoint mode, is it not? Then you can just clip the things. I mean, no, no, go, go back, go back, sorry. I, I was just saying, because you're into scrolling, yeah. So anyway, uh, as a, you know, you can see to the BRICS High Level Forum and the speaker who is a person like me, the lay person who cannot claim to say match Dr. Hari Oren's knowledge on green buildings or sustainable cities. But uh, the idea is to showcase a conceptual framework. You know? 
Next, please. So, as far as green businesses are concerned, I do feel quite optimistic that uh, we have now reached a tipping point and where it is going to find greater and greater acceptance by the citizenry. And I definitely have far more optimism on Gen Z with climate change and sustainable development emerging as belief systems, you know, which are impacting citizens' needs and hence influencing the way corporates conduct businesses and also how governments formulate policies and administer municipalities. Next. So uh, it's just to give us order of magnitude, you know, so KPMG had made a projection that reality sector will surpass 850 billion by 2028. A little higher, please. So green buildings are gaining prominence in India from regulatory, uh, you know, uh, push such as the ECBC, then financial incentives, some incentives are like being given to different states in the form of FSI, and of course, buyer preferences is emerging, thanks to the great work done by Dr. Jain and his team. Next. But the rules of engagement, no, lower please. Rules of engagement have to change. So I've given this uh, illustration of David and Goliath. So urban agglomerates, which have become so huge, and the early administ administrative structures can't cope either with accelerated urban growth or the transition that has to be made towards sustainable cities. But the advantage of decentralized architecture of green businesses is actually the green businesses are inherently uh, optimal with the decentralized architecture which enhances accountability, improves efficiency and efficacy, as we have seen recently in compute and telecom industries. Next, please. Next. Uh, this is stating the obvious to young people, you know, uh, green economy offers many jobs and frankly, many, many more green opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities. Next, please. Now, green buildings is a huge growth area. As per an IA forecast, uh, the, with a 2040 urban population of 740 million, there'll be need for 50 billion square meters of residential area versus 19 billion that existed in 2019. And there'll be quite obviously an impact on built commercial area and industrial area. So the net zero goals must encompass buildings, but I've flagged not limited to green buildings occupied by corporates, but all buildings. Furthermore, there's a need to distinguish between net zero energy buildings and net zero emissions. In case of the former, you tend to look within the four walls or your perimeters of your gated establishment. Whereas for net zero emissions, the GAG mitigation would have to encompass the complete value chain and the lifetime of the building, linked to mining, transport of minerals, production of construction materials, during building construction phase and use phase, as well as end of life treatment of construction demolition waste. Buildings must be water positive, must adopt circular economy, and will need nature-based carbon removal since there will inevitably be some use of fossil energy to achieve net zero emission status. Apart from green building design, focus is also need on green, needed on green construction materials, such as alternative to cement, sand, aggregate, steel, which increasingly are coming with higher and higher embedded carbon, as well as low carbon resource efficient construction processes. As I already mentioned earlier, it's therefore necessary to also widen the penetration of renewable energy and energy efficiency systems, circular economy solution for entire range of buildings, catering to the needs of the economically weaker sections, low income, middle income, and high income groups. Next. So I think most of you know this and the key green design parameters. So I won't really read that out. 
but uh, I'll say particularly in current context, you know, I mean, particularly 2022, where there's been a spike in energy costs and, you know, inflation has uh, once again raised its head. So green design has definite advantages. It optimizes uses of all resources, hence it's a saving of capital as well as operating costs. And materials and energy efficiency reduces greenhouse gas emission and pollution. So it really is something that needs to be followed. I mean, the kind of path-breaking pioneering work that Dr. Jain has done over the last so many decades is now reached a stage where it really needs to get pushed into exponential growth with young minds like you all. Next. So these are just some illustrations to say, hey, this is just not theory. It's being done. It can be done and we should do it. Next. Next. So even in the context of energy, you know, we are completely transforming the, you know, this is a, uh, not really energy as much as power, but uh, the power grids are going through transformation, the generation is going through transformation with larger and larger, uh, you know, quantum of uh, renewable energy, then decentralized renewable energy with storage is going to play an increasingly larger part, uh, different approach towards low capacity utilization, loads like rural areas and different for urban. But this is something which is tangible, delivers, deliverables are there. And if I take, you know, most of the major metros, 1 million population and above. I think the tariffs that are prevailing, not just for commercial industrial, but also for the you know, residential beyond the minimum limits, this decentralized RE, variable plus some you know, uh, dispatchable RE like from bioenergy and storage, in the future hydrogen, it will compete with grid power in terms of delivered cost of supply, and with equal reliability. Next. So here's just an example of a solar concentrate of thermal energy. Next. So, I mean, uh, you know, uh, light control, you know, daylight, light shells, you know, uh, motion sensors, so the various kinds of technologies emerging. So it's just to illustrate to you that the huge opportunities available, these are tangible solutions and uh, it offers immense potential, not just for internet commerce saving the planet, but as a great economic opportunity. Next. Likewise, one can't stress more on urban water management. You know, many of our cities are distressed and we tend to have these you know, sometimes huge downpours and flooding and there's water shortage. So we, we need to definitely have a lot of, you know, water treatment and reuse as well as rainwater harvesting. Next. So rainwater harvesting, then water conservation is a design intent, utilizing water layers or reduced water flow uh, solutions, which again are available and it's just a question of ensuring that we integrate this into all types of buildings. Next. Then waste management, you know, we tend to still in waste. Uh, a lot of work has happened. The Switch Bharat Abhiyan movement has created awareness, distraction. I mean, I also happen to have been the founder chairman of the Green Job Skills Council, and we've trained over 400,000 Safai Karmacharis all over India. But uh, honestly, as we progress, it has to get more organized and mechanized. Uh, of course, in the, a key element is really, you know, source collection. And thereafter, the aggregation, you know, compacting, transportation, and different solutions for processing them, whether it's plastic waste, other dry waste, organic waste, e-waste, hazardous waste, construction demonstration waste. Once again, in all of these, we have solutions, we have equipment, we, we, and we also have uh, enabling system to municipalities. So it offers a great opportunity. Next. You know, one can't, a little higher, please. 
one can't emphasize enough on the need for circular economy. You know, I think this is known to you all because linear economy creates health and environmental hazards, accumulation of waste in landfill sites. And you know, landfill is really a problem in many cities because our cities have grown. So many landfill sites are now, you know, neighboring cities or cities are growing beyond the landfill sites. So this needs to be addressed. And, uh, the, you know, the, we used to talk of three hours, then four hours, now we say five hours, reduce, reuse, recycle, recover and process. Now, earlier the recover and process were a little lesser, but with huge developments in biotechnology for process and digital technology, which enabled wide scale up and remote control, I think a lot of waste can be processed right now. And the last R is for the young minds, rethink new solutions. We haven't done enough. You can think of more things. Next, please. So now I'll touch upon this on, uh, you know, related to sustainable energy, smart and sustainable agriculture to again, show opportunities that exist in green economy. And uh, some of these will have collateral benefits to cities, even if your main intent is to be in buildings. There's a lot of things that needs to be done in rural areas. We do need to create villages into towns. It's not really feasible to have migration of, you know, we have in India, I think about 140 million migrant labor, uh, roughly little more than 50% within a state, a little less than 50% interstate. And as the pandemic has shown, this creates a lot of challenges. I mean, really, they have no security. So we do need to try and see as to how we can create local livelihoods. And in that, habitat, sustainable habitats is very important. Next, please. So just as a, as a mission, you know, because the same kind of a mission can be even for as said, sustainable habitats in rural areas, but it's like a farm linked by economy for inclusive growth among rural communities through deployment of advanced clean tech and digital technologies. So I would emphasize this because of the tendency when we talk in rural to celebrate Jugaad. I think we must stop that. Yeah, sure, Indians have done great for Jugaad for survival, but we really must take the leadership role in technology, which includes rural habitats, use the best technologies, and dovetail them with innovative and transformative green businesses. Innovation, not only in science and technology or design, but an innovative business model, you know, which have a high potential for replication and scale. Next, please. And the vision, yes, one of them is the Prime Minister's Atman Nirbhar Bharat, where he would like to make India a self reliant uh, nation. And he emphasized the role of migrant labor, MSMEs, cottage industry, and of course, Professor, I mean, President Kalam, Pura, provision of urban amenities to rural areas, which is a really true social inclusion program with facilities upgrade, upgradation to ensure rural areas become part of the development processes. Uh, you know, the, uh, in the last seven, eight years, the government has introduced a lot of schemes which really have not been able to, you know, transform um, you know, economic upliftment, because honestly, economic upliftment takes more time and cannot just be done by government intervention. It requires industry, businesses, and, you know, the community. But they've done a lot for social upliftment, status upliftment. So whether you take the Ujwal scheme or the, you know, Sobhagya scheme for energy or, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, all of those schemes. There is also the PMAY for habitats, but that really the really the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to habitats. So I think this offers a huge potential for local manufacturing of green construction materials and have a fair amount of prefabricated construction and sustainable habitats. Next, please. And of course, aligned with national priorities and flagship schemes. So if you want to become a green entrepreneur in this sector, I'm sure there'll be support both from the union government as well as state governments. Next, please. So this is the main theme I'd like to bring in, you know, we need to institutionalize green economy, you know, 
it's uh, it cannot be said, oh, we need to do it to save the planet. We need to do it for grandchildren. No, it is required because it's low carbon, resource efficient and socially inclusive. And it should create growth and employment income driven by economic activities and infrastructure. So not just because it's doing good for the planet. It is through economic activity and infrastructure that mitigate carbon emission and pollution, improve efficiencies in energy and materials use, thus making clean energy and let, even, let me say green buildings transition more commercially viable and preserve biodiversity and natural ecosystems. Next. So this is just an illustration of a farm link by economy. So you can see it's a total circular economy where you know you can see fields, you can see uh, horticulture activity, animal husbandry, and how different ways are taken, <coughs> how they're being processed. It's contributing to energy for cooking. It's contributing for electricity, for mobility, and been integrated with solar, um, coal chain infrastructure. So these kind of examples are there. And all, you know, technology is viable. And it's something which should give a lot of potential for future business growth. Next. So just to illustrate, you know, as this theme, at that time it was showcased in ESG. So I chose this. And it is to de demonstrate that, okay, here's one pathway chosen. But is this pathway being driven because only of greenhouse gas emissions and environment, or because of a commitment made to UNFCC, or does it make economic sense? So first, the opportunity, farm-based bioeconomy. We have 1.75 million square kilometers. That means 175 million hectares of arable land and 300 million cattle. So definitely the huge bioresource available. Then, we can use this land for efficient production of biological resources and that optimal conversion to food, fodder, organic fertilizer, as well as feedstock for bioenergy. And if I may add also biochemicals and biomaterials, which can also get into green buildings. Then it'll contribute to co-products of soil fertility, food preservation. So thus enhancing farmers' income, creating local jobs, increasing clean energy access, and many more green initiatives. Now, hey, opportunity. So what is this going to do if it is biomethane? Natural gas and biomethane or biocene get the preferred clean fuels for energy transition because they have the lowest global warming potential and environment pollution from all fossil fuels. And this caters to all applications, namely transport, industry, cooking, and power, as well as feedstock for bioplastics, biohydrogen, et cetera. And the government of India had set a target that gas will be 15% of the primary energy mix by 2030, and bio will have a capacity of 15 million tons. So yes, it has a market opportunity. Next. So it's aligned with the national policy on biofuels and the target that was set in October, 2018, by the Ministry of Petroleum Natural Gas. Next. Then biomethane has multiple pathways. You can use biomethane to make bio CNG, and as you know, bio CNG today, or CNG, which is, and there's no difference between bio CNG and CNG. So it can be used for multiple applications in mobility as well as industrial heating. And uh, right now, one of the limitations was we were using the type 1 cascades, which were made of steel and very heavy. Now, the type 4 cascade made of HDP and carbon fiber is ultra light and can store CNG up to 40% of cascade weight. Hence, we actually store about four times as much CNG as is stored in a type 1 cascade. So, obviously, you know, there's already a demonstrated uh, case of a a bus traveling from Delhi to Dehradun, 600 kilometers with a type 4 cascade CNG. Then biomethane can be made to buy LNG and biomethane of course can be made to bioplastics and biochemicals. Then biomethane can be converted to electricity and thermal energy through a solid oxide fuel cell. 
biogas is biomethane and carbon dioxide. So you produce biogas, you have taken out the biomethane. Now the carbon, carbon dioxide itself can be processed to syngas and syngas can be used to produce a whole lot of green fuels or again, you know, sustainable plastics. And then biomethane can be converted to green hydrogen and carbon. Carbon is nanoparticles, which again has many high value applications which can also get into, you know, the building industry. Next, please. So again, uh, are we on the right path? Is the uh, product choice right? So here is the Government of India scheme, which is 15 million tons. But as per the study of the ministry, India has a potential of 62 million tons. So hey, this seems real. Then International Energy Association and its India Energy Outlook 2021 has set a target of 30 million tons displacement of natural gas by BioCNG. And the two thirds of natural gas demand in India can be met by biomethane. Then what about the economics? So currently LNG prices are ruling about $30 a million BTU. And though it's expected to taper, but not greatly as gas demand continues to grow, very unfortunate, courtesy the you know, uh, 2022 sa sanctions on Russia and this unfortunate Ukraine thing. But yes, the US demand, EU demand is growing. And even if demand for electricity will reduce with more RE power, the demand from petrochemical feedstock is increasing. So we need to decarbonize natural gas rather than say, hey, we don't need petrochemicals and balancing power for variable RE because solar and wind, as we all know, are not available. They are available when the resource is available. So we need a balancing power. And when you factor in all costs, namely the LNG, which is imported, an LNG terminal, the inland transportation, which can either be through gas pipelines or it may have to be an LNG tanker, then a regasification and compression. The retail price is likely to be greater than $22 a million BTU in the medium to long term future also. So it looks like it is market competitive and doesn't need that uh, sort of like being done just to be a good uh, corporate citizen. Next. So here's just an illustration, you know, of the TTF is incidentally the European standard for natural gas, which is the Dutch, uh, you know, Rotterdam prize. So you can see as on January 2022, it was ruling about 17 euro a megawatt hour. Uh, incidentally, if you convert, uh, you know, dollar per million BTU, which appears to be the standard for natural gas, roughly about 0.3 would be a multiplication factor. So you would have been at about something like $20. But then it grew post the Ukraine war. And it has kept growing. It's kept growing. It's kept growing because not only the demand for gas for heating, but the demand for gas for power. So now it's ruling at, uh, you know, $70 a million BTU. And it's not tapering off below about 130, which would be $40 a million BTU even by March 2025. So yes, it makes economic sense. Next. And here's to reinforce this, that what has been done in India. So effective 1st June 2022, IUC, which used to offer a fixed price of 46 rupees a kg for buyer CNG, has dramatically increased its prices. But I mean, frankly speaking, it's illogical because IOC is trying to make a 22% margin on bias CNG, which is quite ridiculous when they have no risk at all. And secondly, it's illogical that they should price bias CNG less than a CNG price instead of it commanding a premium. So obviously it again makes economic sense even by the Indian market norms. Next. So you can see a wide range of vehicles available, including potential for CNG tractors. So it would be meeting the need for sustainable mobility. Next. Now, when you do anaerobic digestion of bio waste, you produce biogas and there's a digest effluent. 
which contains organic carbon and inorganics. Now that can be converted to compost. So over the years, the price has shot up again, unfortunately, courtesy this uh, Russia, Ukraine thing, you know, price of fertilizer shot up. And this is a price of Amul. Amul retails uh, organic fertilizer. So you can see a 50 kg bag, the sale price about 500 rupees, distributed cost is 450 rupees. So there's a very good margin. If you are tech savvy and you can, you know, do digital marketing, you can get a price of 60 rupees for one kg. Next. Yeah. So now, before I go into sustainable development initiative link the project, I'd like to emphasize that what I've tried to do is I've tried to just give you illustrations as to why green economy makes sense. And more than happy to have questions on you might on your area of interest, you know, whether it's in sustainable cities, both of these green buildings, I'm sure Dr. Ariaran will supplement. But I'm emphasizing that I did not try to sh show things to you as uh, a pathway. I just wanted to give an illustration as to how green economy makes a lot of sense. And when you adopt any of these things, you're also contributing to sustainable development in many ways. Next, please. So, yeah, little higher, little higher. Little higher, please. Yeah. So, Skills Council of Green Jobs has created pre Paris Agreement and um, by MNRE and uh, CII. Uh, I was fortunate to be the founder chairman for, for six years. And you also have created a center of excellence in Bangalore. And, um, you know, the, the main theme is. As the prime minister said in Glasgow, actually, even if you all go to the Paris NDCs, India, apart from quantitative NDCs, gets some qualitative NDCs, which really spoke of sustainable lifestyles. But the PM articulated this in Glasgow as a clarion call for the world, saying, I give you one word that is life, L-I-F-E, lifestyles for environment. So we would like to propagate that. I may mention out here that the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has brought out some very nice booklets, uh, which highlights sustainable lifestyles of Indians going back to millenniums. So it's an interesting booklet. If you know, people are interested, I can try to make sure I get some copies and share with you all. It's pretty heavy in content. So I don't know whether you want that one has to make a document box or something like that. And uh, then President Kalam again, he said, you cannot change your future but you can change your habits and surely your habits will change your future. So this is a very important theme, which we all must carry. And whether we're doing green buildings or we're doing uh, green energy or sustainable mobility, I think we have to contribute to, you know, ushering in the green economy by changing lifestyles and habits. Next. Yeah. So, uh, We've tried to create a program for youths, youth ambassadors for life. And the aim out here is high school students. So they'll be provided multiple learning as well as self learning opportunities, facilitating pursuit of higher education vocational training, which, believe me, in rural areas is very well appreciated by parents and community leaders. And even, let me tell you, in cities, because a lot of our cities have slums and people are really. A, you know, I mean, just a statistic, 1.25 billion Indians live below $3 a day. So, you know, uh, we celebrate the 150 million Indians who are the middle income, high income, but bulk of India is not that. So I think we need to create earning opportunities for them. And unfortunately, Industry 4.0 will not do that. By its very nature, Industry 4.0 will, through technology, increase efficiency and scale up, but it will require lesser and lesser humans. It will create jobs for the, you know, $100,000 of upwards uh, people. But those who need jobs are looking for $3,000, $4,000 uh, jobs, you know. So this would be a very good thing. 
So I quote Mahatma Gandhi, a small body of determined spirits fired by unquenchable faith in the mission can alter the course of history. So that is what we white haired people would like you youngsters to become. You can alter the course of history. So youth ambassadors can life can have a multiplier effect in bringing about behavioral changes as required for sustainable development and to mitigate cl climate change and violent pollution within the community. And the good part is this youth ambassadors alive can also be mentored to become rural green entrepreneurs. You know, so it has multiple advantages. Next. Then uh, this is something which is really uh, work in progress between uh, Dr. Harir and me. We are trying to see as to how we do some very focused capacity building uh, and training programs for polytechnics and college students on green businesses. So covering the entire gamut of sustainability, mobility, sustainable water, four hours of waste management, green buildings and construction materials techniques. There are about 80 modules for skills council of green jobs. Then of course, you know, all tech foundation and uh, CVC training. So I'd like to flag out here, we're not trying to replicate what IDBC is doing. They're doing it at a higher end. We are trying to do it at a much lower cost and reaching out to a large number of people and essentially looking at polytechnics and colleges in rural districts. You know. And also cross-sectorial courses, which will enhance employability, you know, skills required for green entrepreneurship, such as computers and digital literacy, finance and accounting, basic fundamentals of engineering, information technology. Next. So here's just some illustrations, you know, when we tend to think of agriculture residue, there's the image of maybe a woman bending down to collect and bundle agricultural residue and then another woman holding it ahead and walking. No, these are, you know, this is uh, CNN Holland, you know, it's the world's largest agri-machinery company. They have established factories in India and they've got customized machinery for small farms. So you can collect and aggregate waste in a mechanized fashion. And you can also transport it with sustainable energy, which could either be to an EV or a bio CNG vehicle. Next. Then you have waste stream valorization. I've already mentioned about compost. Next. Then there can also be the waste stream valorization carbon dioxide. I've shown the more high-end thing of how we can consider uh, convert it to green fuels. But another simple thing is to convert carbon dioxide to dry ice and use dry ice for passive refrigeration. You know, there's a lot of passive, uh, you know, wet ice used for passive refrigeration. And many small farms, you know, they can't really afford those uh, large, uh, you know, uh, Ingersoll Rand uh, cold storage trucks costing 80 lakhs, etc. So you can have LCVs with dry ice. And after all, when you, when you transport food or fish to air in an aircraft, you use dry ice. So we can use the same principles and use it even for transportation to a pack center, to, you know, some distribution warehouse. Next. Now, once you enter and you are an entrepreneur, you have administrative capabilities, your financial capabilities, there's so much that can be done as smart and sustainable agriculture, you know, which optimizes inputs, enhances yield, and increases farmer income, you know. So this is uh, like, a, like a schematic, you know, of crops management. And we're talking of two acre farms, we're not talking of the large farms. Then we're talking of irrigation water management, then soil management, utilizing technology, bringing in agroforestry, natural infusion, micro irrigation contour mapping. So this is another huge opportunity where green entrepreneurs can enter into. Next. Then high efficiency solar pumps and controllers. Next. Enormous potential for, uh, you know, increasing value to net houses, greenhouses, you know, which will increase not just the yield, but will increase the quality of the produce. 
and hence the value of the product, including for exporting. You know. I mean, China's share of vegetable exports is humongous. I think it used to be 10 times, even now I think it must be at least five to seven times India's exports. And India's agroclimatically better suited than China for vegetable growth and exports. Next. So the complete cold chain infrastructure, you know, whether it is with, uh, you know, vegetables, fish, and as I said, we can use passive refrigeration. Next. Then a whole range of concentrating solar thermal applications, which can be used for, uh, you know, heating as well as for cooling. Next. Now here's an efficient uh, example of the efficient cook style. And why I like to flag this is the person who developed this, the innovator was an income tax department officer who worked in the department for more than 20 years, but he was a foodie, he loved cooking. And he was wondering as to why the old grandmother's way of cooking on charcoal always made more efficient food. Therefore, he invented a radiant heat transfer cook stove, which got a UNIDA award. And look at the efficiency. A classical blue flame community cook stove has an efficiency of 46%. This cook stove tested by the oil marketing company, the LPG Center, has an efficiency of 69%. So likewise, if you take for a domestic cook stove, LPG cook stove would have an efficiency of something like 67, 68%. This one reaches close to 80%. So it increases efficiency and offers alternatives to shift over to sustainable fuels. Next. Yes. So I have mentioned as to how many great opportunities there are. But uh, in my concluding thoughts, I'd like to say celebrate innovation, but link to green real ground realities and balanced approach. If nothing else, the energy and food crisis post-2022 sanctions Russia has taught us the pitfalls of hype and hype before. Some of you may be knowing, but some may not. In Glasgow, India was criticized, some media even castigated, because India wanted a last minute change in the wording of phase out of coal to phase down of coal. It's, oh no, but renewable energy is available. Why don't you shut down all your coal plant? Why don't you go to renewable energy? Likewise, of course, that, you know, phase out of gas never came. But the green activists didn't want even a word mention that natural gas, which has the lowest global warming potential, to be mentioned as a transition fuel. That means we should try to phase out coal and then phase out oil and then eventually phase out gas or decarbonize gas. They didn't want it. Now, Europe was the most advanced in being able to integrate renewable energy into their grids whether it is an electricity grid or a gas grid. And look what happened after Russian sanctions. The price of oil shot through the roof, the price of coal shot through the roof, power has shot through the roof. It has led to food shortages. There are hundreds of millions of people all over the world suffering. So it's very important that we should be based on ground realities and not hype and hyperbole. And this includes for all the pathways not just energy and transport and buildings and industry, but for all the pathways. So I give you two quotes of Einstein. The young Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. So I hope you young listeners are in that mood. So please let you unleash your imagination. But the older, more mature Einstein said, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. So don't disrupt before it's ready to be disrupted. We now find that algorithms are ruling and we are so thrilled about it that we are trying to disrupt systems without really knowing whether the replacement can fill in what you're disrupting. You know? So we need a balanced approach. And that can only come through discussion and debate. It will not come through getting excited on WhatsApp forwards. So discuss, debate, 
introspect. And I'll end with what was taught to me decades ago on the old Vedic way of learning. It was Purva Paksha, Khandana Siddhanta. Purva Paksha is study the other side. Khandana is to refute. So if you have an idea, have a friend, have a mentor, have someone else to refute your ideas, to tear it up into pieces. No, no, please. Yeah. No, no, you can go to the next slide also. No. Tear it up into pieces. And then, and then is Siddhanta, that is synthesis. So have an idea, study the other side, refute, and then synthesize. <clears throat> so it's, as I said, just to set a context, I look forward to queries and debates. And uh, more than happy to respond at any time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, really wonderful. And, uh, you know, uh, from one of the uh, coaching line uh, from your presentation, the lifestyle of environment uh, immediately uh, in my mind, uh, uh, one of the quotes of Rakesh Junjula uh, come to my mind. What he said, uh, you know, the Rakesh Junjula, he's also called the, uh, you know, the uh, after uh, Warren Buffett, he's the Warren Buffett of India. So he know what is uh, investment in economy. So what he said, I invest, uh, you know, Thank I you. invest Thank less in, 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 in my health, but uh, most in economy. Uh, uh, so, uh, so um, now for like that, uh, for the people also, they should, uh, you know, uh, put their investment, uh, same to same, uh, the, the planet or the country uh, should put their investment uh, to the particular, uh, you know, uh, the green uh, process so that you know it will revive especially after uh, pandemic uh, our uh, economy is reviving so it's like a green recovery and this green rebuild of this uh, nation you know uh, actually uh, like uh, we actually involve we want to involve uh, the more in the renewable uh, uh, things rather the well or gases and uh, we also in the different energy efficient home also we are investing so now uh, what yeah, yeah. so uh, there is a... okay so <coughs> you know, we I, have, have to I, I, i'm sorry I, I didn't get the full import of your question but uh, from what I could make out, uh, it's as if you feel a transition to lifestyle for environment is either a higher cost or a sacrifice. Now, the point I was trying to make is we have reached a state where neither is applicable. You have sustainable alternatives, whether it's for energy, mobility, buildings, industry, etc. Yes which are cost efficient. Secondly, that's why I showed you illustration. The only object to show illustration that you can adopt. No question, he was making an observation, that's all. Yes. Sustainable solution without making a sacrifice. The other thing is, you know, if you take India as a country, uh, we have really been, a, 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 we have been fairly frugal and sustainable for, uh, as I said, for millenniums and definitely centuries, even a recent thing. So I don't think adopting any of these things, we are asking people to make sacrifices. They're just saying adopt a sustainable solution. Yes. And the, 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 in, there is a new job opportunity also you have described. So yes, uh, renewable, yes. Renewable energy definitely uh, creates some job opportunity on that section. So. Don't don't say renewable energy. Say green economy. Yes, yeah, green. Yeah, green. Yeah, I, green. I, I, will, I will share a booklet to do the skills mm -hmm. company of green jobs, which gives the green jobs. I mean, it gives a perspective of uh, green economy and green jobs up to 2047. So I will, you know, share it to the organizers and they can distribute to who is interested. 
it's yeah thank it's you in, thank you it's in, it's in tens of millions so it's it, huge opportunity and as i said there's a this is actually there's a lot of linkage with digital technology so it, it's really a combination of you know uh, the the green economy and digital technology you know so it's very exciting it's not a, a low scale type of job but there are huge opportunities thank you thank you sir. so uh, there is uh, some uh, yeah. Question has been raised. Uh, okay, so uh, already uh, let Jamal Khan, you can uh, unmute uh, and put up your question, please. Okay, organizers, can, can you please uh, unmute uh, Jamal Khan and Gunjan Kumar, please? Okay, let me give me the give him the access. Yeah. Jamal Khan, you can you can you can ask your question. Also please unmute Gunjan Kumar also. I think yeah. Gunjan sir, uh, Gunjan sir, can you yeah. okay? Is I'm audible enough? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. You are okay. audible. Okay, fine, fine. Uh, so very thank you, sir, for your uh, wonderful talk and, and getting connected with the topics, which is in fact that indirectly uh, the value addition for a net zero mission of the nation uh, with covering almost all aspects what you mentioned right now. Uh, uh, so I have a sir, few specific questions uh, and also on the behalf of all the audience, also I want to extend the thanks to you. Uh, but I have a few questions to ask before that. Uh, my question, as you mentioned with your one data, that uh, 2040 with IEA report, uh, 740 million urban population is expected and 50 million square meter built residential space that we have. Sir, how you see the intervention of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, for residential segment, as you mentioned, uh, as on date, it is, uh, there is no audit is in the place. Even you know the commercial building this year's in the budget, uh, I can say if you refer the PAT cycle, a few uh, uh, commercial building was added in the PAT cycle as a, uh, as a trial. So how you see the uh, audit of a buildings, which is right now India is still in the phase of, uh, I can say the rating, which is the design phase or in the operational phase of three years. But a building has a life of, a hundred year or sixty to hundred years. So the post occupancy, how you see the audit can play the role uh, for a energy conservation, and as you mentioned, also the lifestyle. Because if I not not measure, if I'm not monitor, then how I can change the sustainable lifestyle? So this is uh, I want to understand from your perspective on this aspect. So I'm clear the, with my question. Yeah. So here there are two distinct parts. The first part is on the, the building up to the construction phase and handing over phase. And the second is in the in-use phase. So the thing is that, uh, you know, like say when Dr. Jain started this journey 30 years ago, well ahead of his time, a lot of selling had to be done to people as to why you need to do it. Today, when you talk of, you know, the corporates or larger companies, it's, it's like uh, uh, they kind of accept it. What we now need to progress, like what has happened in, that's why I gave examples of, uh, you know, computing and uh, telecommunications, or we are right now seeing in the e-marketing, m-marketing, everything is a, is, a, is a game of volumes of scale. Now, if you can see this volumes of scale, they will be businesses for producing green construction materials. They'll be businesses for creating prefab components. They'll be business for, you know, having, uh, you know, low carbon footprint construction methods. So we can reduce the carbon footprint of a building in construction phase, you know, including the supply chain. 
that offers a huge opportunity because of the economies of scale that are being offered. And you're very right, a building has a long life. So we need to get into it as fast as possible because otherwise we are leaving a legacy buildings which have a high carbon footprint. In the operational phase, that is where life comes in. So we need to, like one of the things, I just had a lunch meeting with the new country director of the World Bank and I emphasized on this as to how, and fortunately he asked me a question on life. You know. So we need to have these kind of sensitization programs and you know, we maybe we can even think of it the trust how we will try to uh, work this out. You know, we need to get people to understand that when they do follow the four hours of waste management, not four hours actually, we just want them to, uh, to collect and aggregate the waste. We don't want them to do anything else. We want them to ensure that they insist on proper water treatment system. We want them to insist insist on rainwater harvesting, and none of these add to their cost. If you look at even a few, I take a five-year or a you know ten-year thing. I can't think of any sustainable practice which adds to the cost of a homeowner. So we need to do the sensitization and get people to start adopting, you know, green practices. And uh, yes, uh, uh, as I said, I, I will uh, I will share. I think I've already shared with uh, Hari. I, I think I've shared with you, you know, the MOA 1060 booklet. You know? Yeah. So uh, I, I I think you will share it with Payal and. Uh, Hello. Yeah. 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 Your voice is breaking. Uh, all I'm saying is that to emphasize. Uh, your voice is breaking, Hari. That's why I put my cell phone. So anyway, I, I, I'll... I'll Dr. Hari Haran's network is very poor. I'm sorry, Krishnaji. He's uh, jumping in and out of it. Sorry about that. So uh, Gunjan, I'll just continue. So th there are a lot of efforts being made to propagate sustainable lifestyles. And uh, apart from the work being done by the ministry, I'm sure, uh, you know, we'll work with entities like PMJT, et cetera. We need to have a system by which we start sensitizing people. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, honestly speaking, the I, I was very happy with the traction we got with zero plastic pollution. When in World Environment Day 2018, that was the theme, zero plastic pollution, not zero plastic, but zero plastic pollution. And by end of 2019, I was seeing some results, but the pandemic has of course changed everything. But uh, we should propagate this lifestyle. That's why we also brought in this concept of youth ambassadors for life. The, I mean, my granddaughters are against burning crackers for Diwali. So children can be a great catalyst. So I, I, I think it is something we should all peg away and it'll happen. Perfect, sir. Total agree with your sir, uh, what you have impressed on all of us. And with the note, uh, in, 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 in with that only that this Prime Gen Memorial Trust, in fact, under the great leadership of Pyle Gen and all the trustee uh, has uh, started this awareness campaign with the toolkit of plastic free campus, then the uh, saving of water toolkits uh, with all these small effort and further all the talk that you are delivering like that in the past. It's really helping all the uh, ecosystem to perform. Uh, in continuation, I have a last question, sir, uh, before I will end. Uh, uh, so my last question is, sir, today with this platform, I'm sure uh, many of uh, uh, faculty and also the student have joined across the nation. Uh, so my one question going to state forward to you, Regarding this capacity building, uh, you suppose you considered we have a very good numbers of engineering institute or development institute across the nation, and we have a good volume of engineers coming out. And also you have given one, two very good example of the, uh, the mission of our current prime minister, this Atmanivar and the Pura, which is very important for a village, which we all know required to be a supported with a, uh, this uh, sustainable development economic plan, uh, and as you mentioned, the green economy. Sir, how you see this capacity building uh, and the integration of uh, uh, this, uh, whatever the skill we are producing at the engineering college 
how they can solve and contribute uh, in this green economy, economy of the village. Uh, few with the few examples is good to uh, to the, my student and other to get connected. Over to you. Sir. As I told you, I showed you what Skills Council of Green was, why it was created, and what it has done. We have 400 training institutes. Of the 400 training institutes, about 44 are engineering colleges. So capacity building is a very key element. I even mentioned about the capacity building, which was being done along with the World Bank. You know. So capacity building can be done. If your college wants it, we can find a way of doing it. We can find, a, this can be discussed between, um, uh, you know, Pyle and Hari. We can do it through the trust. We, you can become a training partner, whatever role you want from skills culture, green job that should be available. So there, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a very standard system. And, and we, have, we have a lot of courses which are done online. For International Solar Alliance, we've done training in two African nations in three countries. So capacity building, you decide what you want and more than happy to support. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. But root it through the trust. Sure, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was a fabulous, very insightful session. I think Dr. Hariharan is having difficulty logging back. So I'm going to take this opportunity to thank uh, Prishinji. Thank you very much. Thoroughly enjoyed listening to you. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, th thank you, IEM, uh, Kolkata. Uh, thank you, Gunjanji. Thank you, um, Balaj, you, you know, you have always been with us. So I'm very, very grateful. And I hope PJMT can continue doing this and uh, engaging um, sustainability leaders and um, stalwarts uh, like Krishnji we have here. We look forward to continue doing this. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Any last words from you, Bitarji? Would you like anything you'd like to say at conclusion to your students? Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you. So I believe the student definitely uh, because it's a very uh, you know they'll find many research topics from that. Even uh, they can utilize these ideas in their project also. So I encourage them to uh, do needful and it's. Uh, Definitely helpful for the uh, for the society as well as the it's win-win situation for all of you, uh, all of us. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir, and thank you all. We would like to invite your students if anybody is interested to be green ambassadors with PJMT. We have students from all over the country, so please feel free to write in to us in case you're interested to take on. Um, the role as a green ambassador for PJMT. Thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you, wonderful session.